Hello? Today, I'll show you how I made this 154,000 mAh powerhouse. Recycling old notebook batteries, the different uses you can give them, and how I saved a fortune by doing it myself? The easiest and most affordable way to obtain lithium batteries is typically by purchasing and recycling old notebook batteries. To open them, you must disassemble them as best you can, which always involves breaking the battery since there's no alternative way. Use pliers or any other tool to disassemble and open them up. I always buy notebook batteries. Well, this time, I bought several batches of batteries that simply didn't work or that hadn't been tested or things like that. And usually, notebook batteries don't work because one of the batteries doesn't work, so the whole battery doesn't work anymore. Another easy way to open it, I know many will comment on this, to open it, strike it forcefully against a hard surface like the floor to break it open. Generally, this is not the best option because, well, you can damage the battery to recycle, but, well, if you have a lot of batteries to open, people who recycle these batteries usually do it this way. It's not uncommon to find people who do it this way. I don't think so either. The times I did it, I never broke any internal cells, so I don't think anything will happen. Once the internal cells are removed, they are called cells. These are the batteries that come inside. They start removing all the little plates. And be careful because there are always little pieces stuck. And these pieces can be very sharp and you can cut your fingers. So be careful or use gloves. Another clear point is that these batteries are not that fragile. You're not going to cut and break them easily. Because they are made of metal. I mean, they, they are made of metal and come with a little plastic... Once you have taken them out, check the voltage. If the battery gives you between 2.5 and 4 volts, it's perfect. If it gives you zero or similar, it doesn't work. And throw it away because there are ways to recover them, but they are very dangerous. For a reason they no longer work, I mean it's better to discard them. As I already told you, those that have between 2.5 and 4 put them to charge because they work. I mean, they are the ones that will surely work. Ensure the batteries don't heat up while recharging them. Those that have one volt, one and a half volt, something like that, I mean, they are not on one side or the other. We can still try to revive them using a lab power supply providing three volts at 300 milliampers. But you can use a voltage converter or anything cheaper. You give a little bit of current to the battery. That is the positive with the positive and the negative with the negative. You give it a little while, that is a few seconds, and then measure it again with the tester. As you can see, the voltage went up a little bit, which means that this battery can work. You keep going until the battery has about 2.5 or 2.6 volts. And at this voltage, the charger will recognize them. That is, you will put them in the common charger as you would with one that already has a correct assembly. You know it works. And if the charger is good, it will start charging the battery. Be particularly cautious with this battery. Regularly check it and ensure it doesn't overheat. Keep it under constant supervision, which is necessary for all batteries, but be extra vigilant with these. Once you have the batteries charged, you are going to do a capacity test. You can only do this with chargers like the Lidocala Li500 or the Opus BT3000. I'm going to leave them in the description. Or if you don't have the means to buy this device, which tends to be somewhat expensive, you can use this board, which is much cheaper. It only allows testing one battery at a time, which can be time-consuming if you have many batteries to check. Once you've done the capacity test, it will give you a number, which is the capacity of your battery. Write that number on the battery, on each battery. If you don't keep that number, You'll lose it later when you need it. Damn, that number is very important. Once you have the number written down, put it on all the batteries and put them back on charge. These are the batteries that I couldn't recycle directly or that came dead. I recovered about 70 batteries and I threw these away. Honestly, it was pretty good considering all the batteries I recovered. I expected to have many dead batteries, but they turned out to be really good. They charge all the batteries again and wait a week. In a week, they measure the voltage of all the batteries again, and if they have less than 4.0, 5 volts, they discard them. In other words, such batteries are not useful as they discharge themselves. 
Now let's make our battery pack to connect them. We'll use repacker.com for that. You prioritize listing all the battery capacities and their corresponding numbers first. In the second one, which says number cells in series, excuse my English, you put three because we are going to make a 12V battery. That is three cells in series and 23, which are the total amount of your batteries, divided by three, that is, in my case, it's two, three. I will tell you which battery to put in each of the three packs, separating them accordingly. Which are the three packs that you will have to make with the batteries, and which batteries should you put in each pack? You will need to solder the packs in series and parallel, which we will discuss later. These are holders of 1800, 60, and 50. They are called that in case you want to look for them. They are plastics that are used mainly to arrange the batteries and make the soldering work easier. You can choose not to use them if you want, but well, it's better to use them. The three battery packs are now complete, with each battery placed precisely as instructed on the website. They join them into a large battery, which is actually going to be your finished battery, the battery pack that you're going to use. As you can see, these separators allow air to pass through, which helps ventilate the battery. This is my spot welder, as demonstrated in my microwave video on this channel, in case you're interested. I'll leave it here in the corner, and as you can see, it welds quite well. I used 0.8 millimeter nickel tape, if I remember correctly. And if you can't find this nickel tape, you can use wire and solder as usual, but it's going to cost you a lot more. The nickel tape is applied with the homemade spot welder, and it sticks directly to the battery. It's much easier, much more comfortable, and quite a bit faster. Remember that we had three battery packs made with all the batteries we had. Each pack should be soldered in parallel, that is, all the batteries connected together, and in turn, the packs should be connected in series. You can see in the video, you can guide yourself by how I did it. That is, you have a negative pack, another positive pack, which is the one in the middle, and the other negative. Again, they put the negative and the positive soldered together, and on the other side, the same, but with the other one. That is, they don't solder the positive and the negative again. We'll install a battery management system on the battery to regulate charge, discharge, overload, and over-discharge. The battery management system regulates the temperature and other factors to prevent stress or damage to the battery. We solder this as it has instructions. They solder the little leg at the 11.5 mark for 11 volts, at the 7.4 mark for 7.4 volts, and so on. If you want, you can search on the internet on YouTube a more detailed tutorial on how to solder the battery management system so as not to mess up. However, the battery requires a battery management system to protect the lithium cells. The lithium battery otherwise can be unstable, and if it is over-discharged or overcharged, it can catch fire or things like that. And then I wrapped it with a tape that is for high temperatures for anything that could happen so that the pins don't unsolder and touch something else. I wrapped it all with tape. I had this Stanley case that had come to me, a tool, I don't remember which one, but I had it thrown around there. I knew that someday it would serve me for something. It had many internal plastic partitions that I honestly don't know why so many were included. I started removing them with the Dremel because I was going to assemble my battery here. It wasn't the best thing I found to assemble the battery. I put some foam so that if it takes a hit, the battery suffers as little as possible. I also put it on the sides and on top, and now I started to assemble everything else. We don't really need much else. We need the inverter that will transform the 12 volts from the battery to the 220 volts that we are going to use for anything we want to connect. And a charger that I, in this case, chose, one of these solar panel chargers. What's good about it is that it allows the input of current from a solar panel or a charger or whatever, it charges the battery and delivers the current on the other side. And it has a bunch of settings that are going to come in really handy for our project. And the rest is mostly aesthetic stuff. I mean, it's how you want your project to look, let's say. I made a little window to put the screen in, and then I started connecting everything. 
Explaining the connections here might be confusing, so I'll provide you with this diagram to help you understand. The charger goes into the first input, the battery goes in the middle, and the inverter goes at the end. I'll include the details of all the parts used in the description, so you can buy the same ones or avoid mistakes. And in the end, I got a battery of 154,000 mAh and 560 bh, which is a lot. I didn't think I was going to recover so many batteries and make such a big battery. And these are some of the things that it can be used for or what you can use your powerhouse or uh, portable battery for. I use my soldering iron continuously for three hours. I can recharge my phone from zero to 100% 76 times. I can power this 42 inch television for eight hours or this internet router for 18 hours straight. I can light one of these pergola bulbs for 22 days non-stop. I can turn on this fan to maximum power for about 8 hours. I can recharge my computer's battery about 16 times. Or they can sell it for about $800, which is what one of similar characteristics and capacity is worth. This solar charger also provides useful information like battery temperature, charging and discharging amps, and more. And to charge it is very easy. We open the briefcase and inside we have the charger. A 12 volt 5 amp charger is commonly used for powering LED lights. You can use one with more amps, but I used this one I had. And there you see how the battery is charging. Since it has 5A and 12.5, it only takes about 8 hours to charge the battery. You can also connect a solar panel where the S charger goes on that same input. In this case, it is one of 100W and would take about 5-6 hours to charge the battery with splendid sunshine. That's all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe and like to support my channel. Comment what you thought. Comment what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, follow me on Instagram since I am. I leave the Instagram in the description in a link. See you in the next video. Bye.